Hello everyone, and what a lovely day it is indeed. This Saturday, August 12th, marks the two-year anniversary of the this podcast, the Middle-Aged Witch Podcast, and I am out of my mind. I, with excitement and gratitude and plans for the future, and let me just tell you, I am losing my mind about it. After more than 100 episodes, more than 400,000 plays on Spotify alone, I am like vibrating with excitement. What began as a total side project with, you know, delusions of grandeur has evolved and become something really beautiful. It's just a community and a labor of love, and I just have to thank you for continuing to click play every week and for coming back for more, for writing in with questions and suggestions. I can't thank you all enough. I just can't. So, without further ado, today's topic comes from a witch called Amanda, who thought it would be cool to talk about death magic. And I am all for it. If you're new to this podcast, well, welcome, first and foremost, but if you're new, I do want to be really transparent about the kinds of subjects that we get into. I am not a love and light only kind of witch. I am not above working vengeful magic when I feel that it's justified. I endeavor to be as kind and as loving and as forgiving as I am reasonably able to be. But I am not a doormat, and neither are you. And this is why sometimes I give advice and spell work suggestions for things like bindings, um, reversals, and hexes, and things like that. I don't shy away from darker themes. We have done, and will continue to do, episodes on baneful magic, which is sometimes called black magic, although I don't care for that term. But we talk about plenty of light and lovely themes, and I am all about manifestation and abundance and positivity, but there has got to be balance. Day is not good and night is not bad just because they are light and dark. We need both to thrive. And so I will always talk about darker aspects of the craft alongside the lighter aspects, because if we don't give proper attention and respect to both sides of the spectrum, we invite imbalance. And so Even if you are not the kind of witch who will ever cast a baneful spell, um, if you are not a witch who will ever practice death magic in any context, it at least bears learning about. Knowledge is power, and the more we understand about the less sparkly and glamorous aspects of the craft, the more powerful we are. A fullness of knowledge of both the lighter and darker aspects of the craft makes us more formidable practitioners. And hey, if you are that witch who doesn't practice the dark arts, it's perfectly valid. You get to decide what to include and what to exclude in your own practice. You you know, as, as the bumper sticker says, if I wanted rules, I'd go to church. But the information is here for you. You don't have to do a damn thing with it. So with that said, I want to talk a little bit first about what death magic is, what it entails. And one of my favorite things about death magic is that when we are in trying when we are trying to enact big changes in our lives, one thing we can always count on is death. Not a literal physical death, obviously, but a death of the old version of ourselves a death to the patterns that we continue to repeat that no longer serve us, a death of the habits that we have developed that we know are not healthy and not helpful. Evolution and growth are definitely aspects of this kind of work, but when we are ready to shed our old skins and become that more enlightened version of ourselves, someone who is more aligned with you know, the attributes that we wish to embody, then we need to be prepared to bury that old version of ourselves. We need to lay that person to rest. We need to mourn that person, um, celebrate all of the trials and 
triumphs and experiences that that person had to overcome in order to be prepared to evolve. And then we need to move on. So, definitely, definitely for that kind of magic. Likewise, when we are ready to begin a new chapter, you know, start a new cycle in our lives, we will frequently need to let go and lay to rest the old chapter. We must conclude the previous cycle before we can begin a new one. And this is also well supported by death magic. It can be very cathartic and healing to have a literal or a metaphorical wake so that we can feel all our feelings and express everything that's in our hearts. But this is like any other kind of death. If we don't face it and cry it out and go through all of these stages of grief, then we're not really going to move on like we want to. And we aren't going to get the results of our intentions and our manifestations like we hope. We have to respect the process. We have to respect death. And we have to stop treating it like it's something scary or negative. Now, with all that waxing poetic about death and how beautiful and necessary and natural it is, it also must be said that we can also call upon aspects of death magic in our so-called baneful work. If we're trying to do a cord cutting, you know, we want to bury that toxic relationship. It's a severance. You know, if we want to do a binding to kill this person's ability to harm us or our loved ones, or if we're performing a hex or a curse, we may include intentions to bury someone's reputation or kill their lies and manipulations and their ability to lie and to manipulate. So that's also a totally valid and awesome use of death magic, but I would be remiss if I fail to also discuss how death magic is something that we can work with and should work with when we are literally dealing with the dead, our ancestors, our friends, our loved ones, our pets who have crossed the rainbow bridge. All of these souls can be accessed and honored with death magic. It's not just about being goth and edgy, although that's cool too. Hell, I went to school in the 90s. Do you have any idea how much black pleather I have worn? So much. I might, I might just post a picture on my stories, just give a little glimpse into those very dark times. But the point is, performing death magic because it's cool is totally fine. It's just that there are a lot of reasons to incorporate aspects of death magic into work that we wouldn't necessarily think of. So going back to the first intention that we spoke of, change. How do we add aspects of death magic to our spell work when we're trying to enact big change? Well, whether we're doing candle work or a mojo bag or pop it or something else entirely, there are things we can include that absolutely scream death magic. Um, snake shed for one, which makes sense, right? The shedding of skin to allow the newer, shinier version of ourselves to come to light. Um, beetles, dead ones. Also great additions to this kind of work. We want to incorporate in a very real and very literal way elements to this work that call upon death to help us find closure to that former iteration of ourselves. Um, morning glories are also good additions. Um, these are very poisonous flowers and we can use any part of the plant, but I like to get packets of seeds and just sprinkle a few right into the work. And this gives us a little one-two punch, um, because we've got this poisonous flower and the seeds themselves are poisonous too, that are going to help us to end this previous incarnation. But the very fact that we're including seeds themselves allows us um, to take advantage of the support of potential new growth. And a lot of poisonous flowers and flower seeds are going to be viable here. You know, belladonna, um, oleander, foxglove, um, hemlock, any kind of toxic flower. So that's change. Now, how can we support cycles? The beginning of a new chapter, a fresh start, 
I like to include a chrysalis when I can. Um, it's not easy to find these in the wild, I'll be honest, but when you do, find a spent chrysalis, snap it up and hold on to it. It is an excellent embodiment of death of one chapter and the beginning of the next. Um, vultures. Now, these are protected birds here in the United States, so I am not advocating the collecting of vulture feathers. However, the inclusion of any kind of vulture imagery in this work is excellent. These are not beautiful birds. These are not birds that we think of typically, um, but so profound and so apt in this kind of work. Um, spiders and spider's eggs. Very nice death magic elements that we can include in work dealing with cycles and regeneration and closure and new beginnings. Um, also mushrooms. Any fungus really, you know, represents growth from death. Um, but what about baneful work? You know, we aren't only here to travel the high road. Let's talk about a few of the ways that we can embrace death magic in these baneful spells. Now, I like to use bones in bindings and hexes. I add bone powder to candle spells. I use bones to help reveal a person's true nature and to bury the false persona that they present. Um, I will carve a name or a rune or an intention onto the bone and I bury it. Um, I'll add bones to protection jars and poppets, mojo bags, anything I'm trying to bury, anything that I want six feet under. I also like ivy and old cobwebs for bindings. And you know what better way to bind someone than to metaphorically wrap them with devil's ivy? It's cheap, it's easy to come by, and it works like a son of a bitch. Um, for general hexes and curses, I like old snail shells. Um, I like to include dead insects, flies, just anything dead and gross. It's going to create a lot of havoc into your target's life. So hex ethically and take responsibility for the work that you do. I am not responsible for your work. You are. But let's talk about death magic too in the context of ancestor magic, ancestor work. You know, when we include flowers on our ancestor altar, like marigolds, you know, irises, yarrow, um, lilies, uh, these are flowers that have very deep death connotations. So this is a good way to honor our death, honor our dead um, by the gifts themselves but we are also using flowers that specifically acknowledge that they've passed their existence beyond the veil. This is the same reason that we would include, you know, skulls or their cremated remains on these altars too. This is an embracing of death rather than a vilification of it. Um, I also like to include vices on my ancestor altar. And by vices, I mean, you know, cigarettes and cigars liquor, um, tobacco, just as a way to offer the dead something that I know they enjoyed in life while also making a sort of tongue-in-cheek acknowledgement that their livers and their lungs can't be harmed anymore. You know, this is a demonstration that we still remember them and the things that they liked and loved, but also shows them that we're happy to go to the trouble of selecting items that are specific to them. We can put any old bread and water on the altar and that's totally valid and it's totally welcomed. It's just nice to go the extra mile when we can to show our ancestors that we know that they come through for us and we are happy to come through for them. So, you know, I'm just trying to give a little insight, a little info as to how we can just start dipping our toes in those death magic waters and also just give a little different perspective on an aspect of witchcraft that is really maligned both outside of witchcraft and even within some collectives under the witchcraft umbrella um, I don't know if you can hear Johnny but he's over there having um, an absolute crisis by the door I apologize um, but you know with death magic it doesn't I mean it's not bad I don't like that word Witchcraft doesn't always have to be only positivity and only love and only light and goodness and meekness and gentleness. Life has ups and downs and we don't do ourselves any favors by treating the downs as somehow bad or fearful 
or negative. There's a lot of room for nuance. And that's all I'm saying. So please write to me. Tell me how you use death magic in your practice. Let's get the conversation going. You can email me at Eli at middleagedwitch.com or find me on social media at at middleagedwitch. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a lovely day and happy anniversary. <laughs>